My name is uh, Roger, Roger Packham. I'm from the Dorset Church, which is a small church in the south of England, part of the Thames Valley Churches of Christ. And I get the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Dr. Andy Boachi, or Andy B, as he's known in the UK, widely known in the UK. I first met Andy in probably uh, 1997, when I was studying to become a Christian in the North London Church, and uh, where I did become a Christian in the North London Church, amen. Um, I guess... uh, Interestingly, in preparation for this, I, I, lo- I logged on and had a little look around on, online. And I found a, a lecture on the BBC that Andy did took part in about masculinity. And um, certainly from my own uh, uh, version of masculinity, worldly sense, you can probably guess that I was involved in the music business before I became a Christian and uh, very much wanted to be a rock star in, uh, in my, my aspiration. I think Andy's version of masculinity, or at least in my first impressions, was something that I could never aspire to. <laughs> uh, the discipline to, uh, to, to, to look frightening, amen. <laughs> Um, but, but having met Andy, uh, I, and I, I don't think I, one would ever, ever describe Andy as a frightening human being, quite the opposite. Uh, we, we, uh, we both ended up in the ministry in North London, it was a strange church at the time, it was kind of a two-headed beast. So Andy was on one side of the ministry, I was on the other side of the ministry, and, and, and amen, I went on to lead the teens, Andy was with the singles in North London. We sat through many, many D groups meetings together. Over the years, uh, we've spent a lot of time together. Um, and then in around about 2001, two, Andy moved up to Manchester to serve in the Manchester church just before 2003, uh, when we all lost our jobs. Um, but Andy was uh, re-employed again very quickly and served in the Manchester church for uh, seven years in the ministry there. Um, he must have had an incredibly understanding wife, which I know he does, uh, because he negotiated somehow into his contract at that time to be able to do a degree in theology, which he did in the in Manchester was it Metropolitan University? No, Manchester University, University of Manchester. And uh, so in 2003, he did a degree whilst in the ministry, whilst uh, having a, a family, being a father, and doing all the things that you do. And then he uh, twisted his wife's arm again, and she allowed him to do a master's degree in 2007, which turned into uh, a PhD which he started in 2009 and uh, finished in December 2013. He was awarded his doctorate uh, with the uh, dissertation based on the life and death, uh, Jesus' resurrection, Israel's restoration, and humanity's rectification in Paul's letter to the Galatians. (laughs) Amen. Um, At the University of Manchester, where he now lectures uh, in religion and theosophy uh, at, at the in theology, sorry, at the University of Manchester, and co-chairs um, the Paul Seminar of the British New Testament Society. Uh, he's the author of Death and Life, Resurrection, Restoration, and Rectification in Paul's Letter to the Galatians, uh, the co-author of Rethinking Galatians, uh, Paul's Vision of Oneness in Living with Christ uh, with Professor Oakes, Peter Oakes. Uh, he's currently working on uh, the New Word Biblical Themes Commentary on Ephesians for Zondervan Press, and his research interests, uh, research interests include Pauline, Pauline Christianity, resurrection theology, masculinity studies, um, and intertextuality. And has been consulted on issues of racial harmony and reconciliation across the Protestant uh, communion. Next year, he'll be delivering the Theology and Race Special Lecture at the University of Durham and the Arthur S. Peak Memorial Lecture. Uh, it's quite a lot. <laughs> Amen. Um, but in, the, uh, in an attempt to, to reground Andy and myself in this process, uh, my most endearing memory of Andy and, uh, is, is when we were both very young in the ministry and somehow we were persuaded, I don't know how this happened, to appear at a Women's Day. You may have been, been there, I don't know what it was, at a Women's Evening in London where, where we and another brother, who should remain nameless, were persuaded to dress up in drag and come out in front of a thousand women in drag and sing Say a Little Prayer, <laughs> which, um, which, which was an unforgettable experience. The minute, minute we, we, we came out 
faces with their backs to the audience, and so they had no idea who it was. And then we all span around alternately, and um, the, the scream, we talked about the Beatles earlier, the scream that erupted was absolutely deafening, and I've never been so terrified in all my life. So any aspiration towards rock stardom disappeared instantly at that point, and I've been living a spiritual life ever since. And, I, and I'm sure um, challenges to Andrew's and his view of masculinity probably at that point changed his life as well. <laughs> so without further ado, let me uh, welcome to the stage Andy B. Yes, I remember that evening very well. <laughs> I am still traumatized. Anyway. Uh, I'm really grateful for this space. I came to the uh, conference in Tallinn for the first time last year, uh, and I love being here. It inspires me to learn, and that's a, a really important thing for me. So I'm very grateful to Matty and Trin and Reto and Andy and Malcolm and all the others who are involved uh, in putting this together. So then, this is my beautiful family. Um, in the left of the corner is uh, my 19-year-old daughter, Storm. Um, she insisted we take this selfie. She is the queen of selfies, um, which I think should be banned from modern civilization, but there you go. Um, and behind there is my wife. I get, I find it really hard to talk about my wife in public settings, because it just makes me emotional, but best day of my life was when I met Jesus Christ. Second best day of my life is when I met this lady right here and I will say nothing else because it will become ridiculous. Okay. <laughs> uh, and in the corner there is uh, my young son, Aaron, who's now 21. Uh, and in fact, this picture was taken on his 21st birthday. So in this next picture is when Aaron was born. This was probably when he was three days old. Aaron was born 15 weeks premature. He weighed one pound and 11 ounces when he was born. He was literally this big. Uh, and I, I'd actually, well, I won't tell you the whole story, but I hadn't actually been there for his birth. I was actually in Manchester. My wife was in London. I raced down, and in the time it took me to get from Manchester to London, she delivered him, because he was so tiny. You know. uh, and when I got there, there were just wires and ventilators everywhere. I couldn't even see him. So this was a few days after he was born when he was allowed out of his incubator. Now, to look at him, you think he was <laughs> totally fine, right? He is, in fact, severely autistic. And although he's physically 21 years old, mentally he's about five or six. Uh, and raising him has been the biggest challenge and the greatest joy of my life all rolled into one. Now, why am I telling you this? It is possible to be physically very old, but intellectually and in every other way, very young. And it's possible for churches to be very old physically, but spiritually to be very, very young. I really appreciate the text that Matty opened the, uh, the conference with in Hebrew 6. So he had the Hebrew author. And he desperately wants to teach the church about these, these, these deep things about Jesus' priesthood about how he's not a Levitical priest, he's a priest in the order of Melchizedek, and that involves you understanding bits of Genesis 14 and bits of Psalm 110, and he wants to go on to those really mature, deep things. But the church still needs milk. It's not ready for solid food. So my title today um, is He Took Captivity Captive, Resurrection, Maturity, and Unity in Ephesians. It's drawn from a couple of chapters of a book that I'm... Uh, writing, as, uh, as Roger mentioned. Uh, I'm actually going to present the sort of technical version of this to the British New Testament Society in a couple of weeks at the University of Exeter, and there's nothing more daunting than giving a lecture to a room full of people whose books you have on your shelf, right? <laughs> so they kind of already know everything, and so it is a little daunting. So uh, here's how I'll proceed today. I'll, I'll say a couple of general comments about unity and maturity. Then I'll outline my key objectives. I want us to really plough into the text of Ephesians. And then, with the issues that emerge from that, I want us to have some very open and frank discussion. And as I always say with these uh, sorts of presentations, the discussions that we have together are much more important than anything I say at this pulpit, right? You will agree with some things that I say, you will disagree with some things that I say, 
and I don't care, right? I'm not here looking for followers or supporters. I don't care if you disagree with everything that I say. But as long as we have some healthy, mature discussion about what it means to be mature, then I will have done my job, I hope. I do think maturity and unity are both mutually informing ideas. It takes maturity for us to live into our unity and not simply to collapse into an unthinking sameness. Right? You get a room full of people to do the same thing and they will look unified. It doesn't mean that they are. One of the beautiful subtleties, in fact, of Ephesians is that it depicts diversity as the very thing which nurtures and promotes unity. I think uh, the more that our unity is based on mature and loving dialogue, the more we will see iron sharpening iron, rather than iron beating iron into submission. <laughs> now, it's a picture that's not just developed in Ephesians. We see it in 1 Corinthians. We see it certainly in the Johannine material. Unity is something that God creates and that we nurture. An immature unity is one that's manufactured by people and enforced by rules. A mature unity is one that comes from God and that we nurture. And this is what I'm hoping to draw out from Ephesians. Now, my thesis today launches from the six uses of the term mystery. Keeps on appearing in uh, Ephesians. We see the six occurrences of the text here. And it means what it pretty much means in English. It means a secret or a hidden thing which is eventually uh, revealed. We see the clearest definition of this mystery in chapter 3. Here's what the apostle writes. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the administration of God's grace which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote brief, uh, before briefly. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to mankind, as it has now been revealed to his holy prophets, uh, holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. So the mystery then is how is it that Gentiles and Israel become one people? This is the thing Paul is saying has been revealed to him and to the apostolic entourage. Now, the prophets routinely spoke about the day when non-Israelites would join God's people. Right, right from the beginning, Genesis 17, verse 5, Genesis 18, verse 18, Genesis 22, verse 18, it was said to Abraham that you will be a blessing to the nations. Right, both in Hebrew, the word goyim, and in Greek, the word ethne, both mean nations, pagans, Gentiles, it's all the same word. So we already know that that's the case. Indeed, we see it in these other texts. Zechariah talks about the day when uh, ten Gentiles will grab the hem of a Jew and say, take me to your God. Isaiah talked about the day when the nations would stream to the mountain of God. So, Israel already knew that Gentiles would become part of the people of God. The mystery, however, that Paul is talking about is that it is through the gospel of Jesus, the Messiah, that Gentiles and Israel would become one people. Now, my reading of the mystery in Ephesians rests on two very important details. First of all, that this first mention of mystery, and we'll come back to that in a moment, is the foundational uh, definition of mystery in the letter and that all the other references to mystery flow from that reference to mystery in Ephesians 1, verse 9. And the second thing is that resurrection is the power that brings unity. So let's think about the passage itself. Here is the, to me, the foundational um, use of the term mystery in Ephesians. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he set forth in him regarding his plan of the fullness of the times to bring all things to a head in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. 
This, to me, is the ultimate mystery, of which all the other references to mystery are a subset. Now, there are four reasons why I think this reference to mystery is fundamental. First of all, it is, of course, the first reference to mystery in the letter, and there is no other parallel anywhere in Paul. Nowhere else does he talk about this idea of everything becoming one thing under Christ. Secondly, later in the epistle, we hear of two entities coming together as one. In chapter 2, Jew and Gentile form one new man. In chapter 5, we hear about husband and wife becoming one flesh. Here, he says all things will be brought to a head. All material reality is going to become one entity somehow, whatever that means, with Christ as the headline. Thirdly, it's the only explicitly, um, and the term is eschatological reference to mystery. That is, it's something he says will happen at the fullness of the times. When the times are fulfilled, this um, bringing of all things to a head will happen. And the final reason is because it actually describes the mystery as his, that is, God's will. This mystery is the divine will. It's a conclusive idea. Now, here's the rub. A few verses later, this same idea is restated with one very critically important addition. So there's the verse we've just looked at. It says this down in Ephesians 1 in verse 19 and following. It starts mid-sentence. And what is the boundless greatness of his power towards us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and made him head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. We see there in verse 22 and 23, this notion of the placing of all things in subjection under Christ's feet, and Christ filling everything in everything. That is a restatement of that earlier idea of bringing all things to a head in Christ. But we've seen the power by which this happened before. It is the same power by which God raised Jesus from the dead. So by that same resurrection, life-making power, God is ultimately going to bring all material reality under Christ. But because the resurrection of Jesus has defied all odds, because most Jews figured that there would be a final resurrection at the end of time, but no one was supposed to undergo resurrection in the middle of time. And so now that resurrection power has been unleashed. And suddenly, this cosmic reconciliation has started. That's why Jew and Gentile come together in chapter 2, because resurrection power is unleashed in the world. That's why husband and wife, which of course is a reflection of Christ and the church, we'll get to that in a moment, that's why Christ and the church have come together, because resurrection power is now unleashed on the world. And we see that taking effect straight away. This is the very next passage, Ephesians 2, and you were dead in your offences and sins in which you previously walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all previously lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our wrongdoings, made us alive with Christ. Resurrection power is unleashed. By grace you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in him. So resurrection power is re-enlivening humanity. We are in this risen state because we trust 
in Jesus Christ. And what's the very next thing that we read? Therefore, remember that previously you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who were called the uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed by the flesh of human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the people of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who previously were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He's talking about the Gentiles. Because you have been raised and made alive, and Israel has been raised and made alive, you, he can bring the two of you together. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the hostility, which is the law composed of commandments expressed in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two one new person, in this way establishing peace and that he might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by having put to death the hostility. The word therefore should always tip you off in the Bible. It means think about what came before. It connects these two sections, the section about being made alive and raised up with Christ with this section about the two becoming one. Here we see the power of resurrection which frees us from captivity to sin, what the author describes as death. So we're raised up from the deadness of sin. And because we're in that state, we can become one new person in Christ. Jew and Gentile, one family in Christ. The author then comes back to this same motif of resurrection from deadness in chapter 5 with this phrase. Now, chapter 5 begins with this list of vices, a bunch of things you should stay away from, impurity and fornication and all those things. And the section ends with this warning. See that no one deceives you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Right, we've seen that phrase before. It was in chapter 2, verse 2. Who are the sons of disobedience? It's those who are dead in their sin. So after he gives this warning in uh, verse 6, um, there's a series of, of, of negative injunctions in terms of light and darkness, and then this climactic, resurrection-based imperative. I'm not crazy about any of the English translations of Ephesians 5.14, but the, the Greek text says, Dio lege egere hot kathudon kai anasta, that's the key word, ekton nekron kai epiphalse soi ho Christos. Therefore it says, rise, O sleeping one, and resurrect from the dead, and the Messiah will shine upon you. Now he starts with, therefore it says, normally when you hear a phrase like that, you expect a quote from the Old Testament. This phrase doesn't seem to come from anywhere in the Old Testament. There are echoes I see with Jonah 1 verse 6, with Psalm 44, 23, Daniel 12, 2, probably the strongest echoes with Isaiah 60, this is 1 through 3. But then this command to resurrect from the dead is followed by this imperative, be filled with the Spirit, followed by a bunch of participle phrases, Speaking, these are all the results of being filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to our God and Father. And then finally, and subjecting yourselves to one another in the fear of Christ. And then comes the key example of subjecting yourselves to one another in the fear of Christ. The mutual submission between husband and wife. Mutual submission between husband and wife. I'll just let that hang in the air for a bit. <laughs> because of course he goes on to talk about the mutual submission between fathers and children, mutual submission between masters and slaves, and try to imagine a first century Roman hearing someone talking about the mutual submission of a master and a slave, where on earth would that happen? Anywhere in the empire. 
But of course, for Paul, this mutual submission between husband and wife is a portrait of the mutual submission between Christ and the church. Christ is described at the beginning of chapter 5 as one who loved us and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice. That's Christ's submission to the church. And we are called to be imitators of God, our submission to Christ. And that's really what he's talking about when he's actually talking about the submission of husband to wife and wife to husband. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, quoting that standard passage from Genesis 2.24, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking here with reference to Christ and the church. So why then this resurrection command that we've just read? Well, I think here again he's re-establishing for the audience that resurrection is the basis of this new unified community. Resurrection brought Jew and Gentile together. Resurrection brings Christ and the church together. Christ was raised from the dead. We've been made alive from the deadness of our sins. And so we and Christ can come together in the same way that uh, he claims husband and wife come together. What we see throughout Ephesians is that unity is created by God's life-making power. And as we'll see in a moment in Ephesians 4, our job is to nurture that God-created unity. I wrote a paper about this um, a little while back, which I I sent to a couple of people in the room, um, trying to outline the difference between unity and conformity. And it's to our peril that we get this confused. I want to quote here from Marianne May Thompson, who is... A brilliant scholar, she's written widely on the fourth gospel and on the letters of John. And this is what she writes uh, in reference to the high priestly prayer in John 17. She says, their unity is organic. It exists not because of human effort, but because of God's life-giving love for the world that is expressed through and in the mission of Jesus. Since the unity of father and son comes to expression in their saving work, Jesus may be understood to be praying that the disciples will be united in the mission entrusted to them, even as the common mission of the Father and the Son in the world demonstrates their unity. But the mission of the disciples only expresses their unity. It does not create that unity. This is what happens when God creates unity. It happened in the household. Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, because that's right. Fathers, don't provoke your kids to anger. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and trembling, in singleness of heart as you obey Christ. Render service with enthusiasm, as for the Lord and not for humans. And masters, do the same to them. Stop threatening them, for you know that that both of you have the same Lord in heaven, and with him there is no partiality. God sees master and slave the same way, husband and wife the same way, father and child the same way. Now, in the empire and with the Greek philosophical tradition, there are plenty of household codes. Only is the man ever addressed This is already revolutionary in the fact that Paul actually deigns to speak to women and children and slaves. He's already crossing all sorts of barriers. This is what happens with man-made unity. This is Aristotle, a student of the philosopher, Plato. This is his household code in the politics. Of household management, we have seen that there are three parts. One is the rule of the master has over slaves, another of a father and the third of a husband. A husband and father, we saw, rules over the wife and children, uh, both free, but the rule differs. The rule over the children being royal, over his wife, a constitutional rule. The inequality between male and female is permanent. The courage of a man is shown in commanding of a woman in obeying. 
All classes deemed, must be deemed to have their special attributes. As the poet says of women, silence is a woman's glory. But this is not equally the glory of a man. And this was a standard household code according to the Greek philosophical tradition. And the Romans lapped it up. Right, here's Arius Didymus writing in his work concerning household management. A man has the rule of his household by nature, for the deliberative faculty in a woman is inferior. In children, it does not yet exist. And in the case of slaves, it's completely absent. Now, compare that to Paul. And you have to put yourself in this context and imagine a first century reader trained in Aristotle, knowing how Augustus was worshipped, hearing the words of Paul. Before you even get to the content, you would think, why the heck is he addressing slaves? Their property don't talk to slaves like they have agency, like they're real humans. But Paul did, because that's the kind of unity that God creates. This is the kind of unity that people create and enforce with rules about who's inferior and who's superior. Then we come to Ephesians 4. Unity is not a community that dogmatically behaves the same way, but rather a community who tenaciously love the same God. He reinforces that unity with the ones in Ephesians 4. This is the kind of unity that ought to be nurtured. He calls it the unity of the spirit. It's one body, one spirit, just as you also called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. That is divinely created unity, what he calls the unity of the spirit in verse 3. But then he says this in verse 7. But to each of us, or to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. We all have gifts apportioned differently. We all have different gifts. This is how we maintain this oneness. We maintain this oneness on the basis of each of us having different gifts. It is our very diversity that promotes unity. It's because we're all different and have different gifts that we can be one. The issue in Ephesians 4, then, is where do these gifts come from? And that's what our key text really is all about. And we'll um, wrap up with a few practicals shortly after this. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive the captives, and he gave gifts to the people. Now, the expression, he ascended, what does it mean, except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself, also he who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. And he gave some to be apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we're no longer to be children tossed here and there by the waves and carried around by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of people, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, that is Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. In ancient conflicts, long before there was any such thing as the rules of engagement, victorious parties would parade vanquished armies around and say, look who we defeated. And they would have the spoils of war with them, usually slaves, but whatever they had, gold, whatever it was, and they would parade it around. Now, Psalm 68, which is what Paul is quoting in verse 8 there, when he ascended on high, that's from Psalm 68. In the psalm, God is that victorious king. 
and he's leading the captives captive, having plundered the army. Paul, quoting here, clearly sees Jesus as that victorious king. Now, in the psalm, when it says, when he ascended on high, it's talking about God sort of going up a mountain in victory. But of course, for Paul, when he went up on high is a reference to the resurrection. When Jesus was resurrected and ascended, he gave gifts to the people. And who, are, who, who, is, the, who is the army that Jesus has vanquished? Well, in one sense, we've already seen it. When he was resurrected, he was resurrected far above every rule, authority, and power, and dominion. Um, we saw in, in 2 verse 2 that people are held um, and, and trapped in deadness according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience. And then again, that famous passage in um, Ephesians 6. We're not supposed to be fighting one another, but we're supposed to put on the full armor of God against the devil. Our struggle is against the rulers and the powers and the forces, the dark forces of this age. In fact, I prefer the more literal translation of this passage in verse 8, and it's where my title comes from, where it actually says he led captivity captive. Because Jesus didn't just defeat an opposing army or an opposing king. He defeated evil itself. He took captivity itself captive. And the spoils of war, the spoils of the vanquished army which Jesus gave to his people um, are these uh, very important gifts. Now, there's one slight problem with, with um, Paul's quotation from Psalm 68. I'll just say this quickly. If you have a look at the psalm, it actually says this. You have ascended on high. You have led captive your captives. You have received gifts among the people. Now, what does Paul say? Says he gave gifts to the people. Now, I'm not going to go into all the issues here. There was, as you can probably imagine, thousands of, uh, of, of scholarly arguments about what is happening here. Um, I would simply say this. Um, the logic of the passage says that uh, Jesus must have ascended in order to have descended and so logically he must have received gifts in order to give them that kind of makes sense and we see the same thing in Acts 2 33 which I've quoted here where the gift is the Holy Spirit therefore he's been exalted at the right hand of God and has received the promise of the Holy Spirit from the Father and he has poured out that which you've seen so having received the Holy Spirit he gave the Holy Spirit so that, that little anomaly doesn't need to cause us uh, too many problems. But Jesus, having been raised, having been triumphant over the powers of evil, now gives these gifts to those who trust him. And the, the, the list of gifts in Ephesians 4 focuses on the gift of the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Now in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12, the gifts are more diverse. We can talk about those another time. But these are, this is the purpose of those gifts, the prophets, the evangelists, the teachers, the pastors, the equipping of the holy ones for a work of service until we all reach that place of oneness in faith and knowledge, to that place of mature people. We'll come back to this in a moment. In order that we're no longer tossed around by weird doctrines, we tell the truth lovingly, so that we might grow up that the whole body comes together and each part plays its role. I'm going to unpack these, each of these very briefly, and this will be the basis of our discussion. The first reason that God, that in Jesus' resurrection, having taken the spoils of war and given these gifts to the congregation, is so that we can equip the community for the work of building up the body of Christ. As you've already heard today, our walk with Jesus Christ is a journey, and building the body is a journey. And the objective is expressed in two related ideas. The first of those is that we might all get to that place of oneness, of faith, 
and knowledge in the Son of God. When the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers all work in harmony, we should have as full a knowledge of Jesus as possible. We need to know him, and we need to know about him. A community whose knowledge of Jesus starts and ends with, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, is doomed to be immature. The knowledge of Jesus Christ is not an intellectual exercise, and this is where I think a lot of people go wrong. Building a sophisticated, deep, and thorough picture of Jesus is about discovering our very place in this world, establishing our identity as people. Indeed, to understand the way God acts and why he acts, we cannot do that without the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I think even in order to be able to celebrate our common humanity with unbelievers, we need to have our identity grounded in Jesus the more profound our, our picture of Jesus, the greater our understanding of ourselves. You think about this. Who do we trust in life? It's the people that we know. The more we know Jesus, the more we trust him. Secondly, or thirdly, it's a place, that place of mature people to an index of maturity of the fullness of Messiah. There are lots of ways we could talk about maturity. I want you to cast your minds back to the first century. I want you to imagine that you are first century Ephesians, hearing the letter read out. What does maturity mean to you? One of the um, leading scholars in the world, in fact, on Ephesians is uh, Professor Clinton Arnold, and his great contribution to the study of Ephesians is actually in the field of the study of magic, div divination, and sorcery in Western Asia Minor. And here I draw from his work, and he writes, of all ancient Greco-Roman cities, Ephesus, the third largest in the empire, was by far the most hospitable to magicians, sorcerers, and charlatans of all sorts. As evidence of such renown, the famous Ephesian letters were six magical words used in spoken charms or inscribed on amulets as early as the 4th century BCE. They were used to ward off demons, curse opponents, invoke success in business or romance. The cult of the Ephesian goddess Artemis was also strongly associated with magic. She was called upon repeatedly in the invocations of magical texts to help her uh, suppliants to affect curses, to bless people. One of the curses of Artemis actually prays to her, draw out the breath mistress from her nostrils. It was a prayer to curse someone. Now this one, it's actually quite a nice one. This is one of those Ephesian amulets and it's actually a prayer for blessing from the goddess Artemis. So there were one or two nice ones. Now, against this backdrop of magic and sorcery, what would maturity mean to uh, first century Ephesians? I think it means this. Firstly, this was an uncertain world. A former pagan will have lived in fear of the powers and the gods and goddesses and would have understood life as being at the mercy of these powers and these div uh, um, divinities. So a former pagan who's now embraced trust in Jesus would understand maturity, at least in part, as the confidence to face uncertainty. This is an uncertain world where you don't know what the gods are going to do at any given time. I think a mature church doesn't need to have everything worked out. Mature Christians don't need to have an answer to every question tied up neatly in a bow. God raised Jesus from the dead. That is the thing we place our trust in. That is the thing we anchor our faith in. Much beyond that, anything we can or we ought to be able to handle. We ought not to be rattled by the tensions of living in a confusing world and a messy church with awkward relationships. That's called life. <laughs> Jesus is raised from the dead. That is the key thing that matters, and a mature person knows that. But secondly, to a first century Christian listening to that passage about the, you know, where the armor of God would have found that very impressive, but we cannot forget the actual charge. We are not supposed to be fighting with one another, but with evil. Now, maybe it was because Jew and Gentile were fighting That's each other. That's maybe why chapter 2 was so important. But mature community doesn't turn on each other. It recognizes how evil wants us to be disunified and be biting one another's heads off. 
but rather we ought to take the strong advice of Ephesians and speak truth to one another. Speak loving truth. Truth is a major sub-theme uh, in Ephesians. It's a number of passages. In the interest of time, I won't go over all of them. But if disagreements and arguments split communities, then there's too much fighting one another and not enough fighting of evil and not enough loving truth being spoken. But the final thing I think that um, an Ephesian believer would understand as maturity is the notion of negotiating fear. The earliest believers would have lived in fear of these powers. You know that tricky passage in 1 Timothy 2.15 where it says that women will be saved through childbearing? Well, unless you think having a baby will uh, allow you to go to heaven, then you must think that means something else, right? Now, I think Artemis, Ephesian goddess, um, amongst other things, she's the goddess of childbirth. And if you were a former Artemis worshipper who's now come into the Christ movement, you'd be scared. If I have a baby, Artemis is going to curse me. And so Paul gives this warning, you'll be saved through childbirth if you continue in love. But this fear, which pervades so many areas of our life, I think, again, a mature community is one that can negotiate and navigate fears. And I think those who lead and teach in communities have got to seek to educate and protect, but not bomb-proof the lives of Christians. We don't deal with the challenges of faith by trying to pretend that they're not there. I think when challenges are brought to light in a mature community, we can talk about them, and most importantly, we can pray about them. And so fears don't need to be uh, the death knell to a community. But once we uh, mature, we should develop a sturdiness which guards the community against the naive embrace of weird and wacky doctrines. Now, not every commentator of the Christian faith who is critical of it is evil and warped and deserving of death. But we all know what it's like when members of our communities embrace wacky ideas, which they've seen on the internet, often put there by people with minimal theological and tra training and all sorts of warped uh, agendas. But it's a sign of our collective immaturity if we're not able to critically and honestly deconstruct new ideas on the religious landscape. I don't think we should be afraid of them. Sometimes we can even learn from them. But one of the most important components, I think, of maturity is what I call rootedness. I remember one time I was reading a, a book uh, called What St. Paul Really Said. And the chap who happened to be leading the church saw me read it and immediately tried to protect me from it. Now, what he didn't know was that the book was actually written by a conservative Christian who's trying to debunk liberal ideas of Paul. So he meant what St. Paul really said as opposed to what all these liberals are saying. But as soon as he saw the title, he thought I, need, I needed protecting from it. Now, younger or more impressionable, believer, or impressionable believers, of course, will need more support to navigate rogue teaching. But we shouldn't, what we shouldn't do is encourage the fear of ideas. When there's honest dialogue, then we can work through these things. I stand by the old adage, keep your mind open, but not so open that your brains fall out. <laughs> Fifthly, from this place of maturity, rather than being hoodwinked by uh, trickery, we should speak loving truth. Now, of course, this phrase is talking specifically, speaking loving truth about um, false doctrines. But with all the references to truth in Ephesians, in 113, 415, 421, and a few other places, it's clear that the, authors, um, it, it, the author is thinking more broadly. Israel Sage, in Proverbs 15, 2, says that the uh, tongue of the wise makes knowledge acceptable, um, that the wounds of, fre of a friend can be trusted. Speaking tr the truth in love um, will be able to deal with anything that's challenging, and we have to hold those two things in tension, love and truth. You cannot have one without the other. And if we correctly use our gifts, we will grow up to be like Jesus. Ephesians 4, verse 16, it says, every part of the body must play its role, and that is key. One of the dangers, I think, of modern megachurch philosophy is that some roles are considered to be more valuable than others. Uh, and 
1 Corinthians 12 teaches us how harmful that is. The roles must operate in mutuality. They're all important. Being an evangelist is not more important than showing hospitality. Teaching is not more important than administration. They all need to work in harmony so that we all grow up to be like Jesus. Uh, you'll be pleased to know that's the end of my blather. What's really important here is the discussion that we have now. So I want us to have, and feel free to ask me any questions that you like, um, express your agreements and disagreements, perfectly happy to accept both of those, but I want us to talk together. What do these ideas about how maturity is pursued in Ephesians, what do they spark in your mind? Let's have that discussion right now. Amen. We're just going to dive straight in, right? Let's just, just do it. So yeah, yeah, go for it. We can have a warm-up, just some feedback, opinions, or right at the back. Oh, there we go. Okay. So <clears throat> I find this um, giving of gifts thing in the context of we're all, we're all one, we're all the same, I find this an interesting challenge, sort of a, not exactly a contradiction, but a complexity. Mm. And you mentioned right there at the end, okay, there's, these are not hierarchical roles of da 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 da. But at the same time, when people feel like they're the gifted and the less gifted, um, I don't know how we make this all fit together because some people feel more gifted than they really are. Some don't feel as gifted as they really are. But, but in any case, people that have been given many gifts by God, is, I find it interesting, this idea that you know, we're, we're all one, but some of you are more gifted than others. It's kind of like, a little like Animal Farm, right? Yeah, all equal, but some more equal than others, yeah. Um, Paul addressed this almost square on in 1 Corinthians 12. When he says that um, not only that the, the eye can't say to the ear, I don't need you, and vice versa. But he then, of course, says that those parts which we consider more sensitive, you know, and he's probably talking about genitalia in that passage, um, we treat with special care. And that's what we ought to do. Those who are less gifted in the community, there could be all manner of reasons why they feel, I keep being poked in the head by these, <laughs> these vicious plants. Um, those people who, are, who feel less gifted in the community could do for all sorts of reasons. It could be because of something which has happened within the community itself. It could be because they were you know, bullied in, in their childhood. And so it's important, and again, I, I stress this on those of you who have leadership responsibilities, it's, it's part of your role, I'm not gonna say it's, it's not your entire responsibility, but it's part of our role as people who lead in these communities to get alongside people who feel like my gift doesn't matter. And it has to come from the pulpit. We've already um, heard from, from um, David that you know, sometimes you know, we, we have this format where the person talks from the front. Like right now, I look super important compared to the rest of you. <laughs> Clearly I'm not. And if, if we have this, this kind of, you know, the, the, the pulpit over there and the congregation over here, it's easy to think certain gifts are more important. But we know from experience, you know that the person that cooks that dynamic meal where you all come together and you lap it up and you know that when you bring your friends to that meal, they'll come again just for the food. And at that moment, you know the person who cooked that food is super valuable to the community. They may not get mentioned on Sunday, there'll be no posters outside saying so and so food is awesome, but you know from the life of the community, how important that person is. But they need to be made to feel that, and that's got to be the responsibility of those stronger ones, right? Those of you who are strong bear with the failings of the weak, right? So. Uh, hello, thank you. It was um, unbelievable. I'm excited. And my question, um, I want to ask how you practice this principle that you uh, share for us uh, in your family when you have uh, a problem or conflict or disagreement. Thank you. 
if you understand my question. Uh, I, I think I do. Just So how do I apply the principles of... Yes, about community, about what you uh, share. In, in my personal family, in your personal, oh, I see. In your oh, right. Um, oh, right, yeah. Um, if I can ask you. No, of course you can. Of course <laughs> you can. You. Nothing is off limits. I, you'll know if something is. Um, um, I, I mean, part of it, I, I'm, in this sense, I'm lucky because um, my wife and I talk all the time. We actually find it very easy to talk, but really that's. That is, that's the main thing, is that there's got to be communication about these ideas. This is kind of my answer to everything. You know, if we would just talk more, we would solve all our problems. Uh, well, that's not totally true, but we, we, we'd make major steps towards, towards doing so. Um, so we, we talk about them. Um, uh, my, my daughter's 19. She's not you know, the most spiritual human being in the world, but we talk about these things even, even with her. Um, and... You know, she, she knows my position on these things. She may not be able to articulate them in the same way, but she, she certainly knows. Uh, and so that really is the key thing for me. It, you've, you've, it's got to be talked about openly and honestly, lovingly and truthfully. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was incredible. Um, you quoted Ephesians 4.13 until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. So what is this unity in the faith? Yeah. Um, I think when I was a younger Christian, I was taught that it's doctrinal unity in the church. So what would you say is this unity in the faith? Where we need to be united? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm leaning more towards what he then, or what he has said previously in Ephesians 4.4. 4 because faith is one of those ones. There is one faith. And I even, I mean, in my translation of Ephesians, which I've, I've probably changed about 20 times now, but um, I don't even use the word faith. I use the word trust, because I think it's, I think it captures the idea. Uh, I think the word faith has a lot of baggage. So trust has, to me, has, has less, slightly less baggage. Um, and so, I think what the author's goal is, is that we will all... Now, I don't think he thinks this will ever actually happen, but as I say, this is, this is the journey, that we will all trust with the same rigour. We will all trust with the same commitment. That ultimately, we trust... Because, I mean, think about any, even just an ordinary situation where there is someone that you trust and someone that you're suspicious of. It's almost like he doesn't want there to be any suspicion... We all trust that whatever we're going through, and in, in any community, people are going through all sorts of things, but if we all trust Jesus with the same vigor, then whatever we're going through, think of the beginning of, of, of uh, James 1. You go through a multiplicity of problems, all kinds of different problems you, he, he, you face, he says. But when, whatever it is, consider it pure joy because you'll mature from it. I think it's the same idea. If we, if, we, if we move towards trusting Jesus with the same level of commitment, then even though we're all in, in, in different situations, um, in, in different social contexts, um, that trust uh, is what anchors us in, in Christ. Can I follow up? Sure, absolutely. I, this is great. Wonderful, I, I, fantastic presentation. Um, I, I get in Ephesians that Paul is talking about unity and the power of the resurrection. You made a statement that we don't put on the armor of God for people inside the community, but how do you reconcile that with Paul saying things like expel the immor immoral brother and... Um, rebuking Peter to his face in front of the community um, and um, naming names, Alexander and Hymenaeus. And when you get to the pastorals, if you believe the pastorals are Pauline, um, I mean, it's almost like a different Paul there when you, you get said to the it, pastorals. Not me. <laughs> so, and I don't know where you are with that, but um, that's, so, I, I love what you're saying here, um, but I just also see it feel like 
Uh, there's another Paul that I see sure. when I read the text. Sure. Um, okay. Like you said earlier, this is a room full of teachers, <laughs> right? So we can say things here that we might not say elsewhere. I know this is being recorded, so don't show it to anyone. Okay? <laughs> now, um, it's up already. Oh, rats. <laughs> um, okay. First thing I'd say to that is, and you, you already know this, but I'll, I'll say it out loud. I think we're, we're quick to run away from tensions in Scripture. And I think we ought to live with them. I, ought to, I think we ought to stay with them. Uh, and we've actually, you know, we've heard some already. So, oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm being mullered. <laughs> thank you. Reto to the rescue. Sure, I'm going to have things growing in the back of my head now and stuff, but uh, Reto's just rescued me. So that's the first thing I'd say. The second thing is that because Paul's letters are all occasional, it's almost like we do get a different Paul sometimes yeah. because he's reacting to situations. Paul never wrote a single word aimed at 21st century debates about anything. I'm sure if Paul came and saw the amount of literature that's been written on his letters... <laughs> He went, what on? I, said, I wrote this letter because I didn't want Gentiles in Galatia getting circumcised. Why is Andy writing this massive tome on, on my letter? Um, so in some sense, we kind of are getting a different Paul, a Paul who's reacting to different things. Now, the trouble with Ephesians is we don't know what he's reacting to because there's no obvious problem. Now, Ephesians seems to be drawing on Colossians in some sort of way, and there is a, a much clearer problem in Colossians with religious syncretism, people borrowing bits of Gnosticism and bits of Jewish mysticism and attaching it to Christianity or whatever is going on. Um, a third thing I'll say, don't throw anything at me, is on some occasions, maybe Paul was wrong. Paul publicly blasted Peter in front of the community at Antioch. Was that a good thing to do? It was a Paul thing to do. <laughs> but was it a good thing to do? I don't know. Yeah. We're told that Paul abandoned um, Barnabas over John Mark. I think that's Luke being nice. I think he abandoned Barnabas because of what happened in Antioch. He actually names him. All these Jews followed Peter in his hypocrisy. Even Barnabas was led astray. I think that's what really separated him. And this John Mark stuff is just a straw that broke the camel's back. He's back in action in, in Colossians, all seems to be forgiven. And of course, Bar Barnabas and Mark are related. We also know that from Colossians. Right? So, and I've had this debate with my wife. Who was right in that situation? Should they have fought for the unity, or was it right that they went in their separate ways? I don't know. So, even with expel the immoral brother, we should expel him, but we shouldn't stop loving him. It should be put out of the community because it sends a strong message to the community. But an even stronger message is that we still want this person to be saved. Uh, and that has to, you know, again, truth and love, they have to work in, a, in an almost inexplicable unity. And, and sometimes, you know, it's easy to get, the, I mean, I'm saying this stuff like it's easy. The truth is that the balance is, is easy to miss. Sometimes there's kind of too much love and we get fluffy about what's, should be true and sometimes there's too much truth <laughs> and we blast people away without really you know getting on their level and again that blend of love and truth I think it's a lifetime work so can I just cheat and just I'm going to give it to you in one second um, I like models uh, transactional analysis is a model mm. of therapy from the sort of 60s, 70s, and uh, it talks about the ego states, different ego states, parent, adult, child. And um, one could say, uh, in terms of when you look at the parent, what causes maladaptive behavior in children is the idea of, a, of an authoritative parent or a smothering parent. Um, potentially, in the church, we've had sort of practices and cultures that have put leadership in the role of parent, Yep. and kept the congregation or other people as children, kept them as children. And the transactions have been like parent to child, parent to child. Here we are sort of as teachers in a sense, and I suppose my, my question would be is how do we change the culture so that even learning as opposed to teaching 
you know, is, is about bringing people into an adult state as opposed to keeping them in a child state. Wow. Um, that is an excellent question to which I have no intelligent answer. <laughs> except to say that it's got to begin in rooms like this. Yes. Um, again, don't throw anything at me. Okay. So I think what you've just said, the, the, the hardest audience to say that to would be a room full of evangelists and church leaders. Because they have a way of doing things, and it's well motivated, and you know the motives behind it are pure and they're positive. But a lot of the time, I mean, again, think about it in real terms. A smothering parent doesn't know they're being smothering; they just think they're being loving. Oh, my child needs this. Oh, my child needs that. And I'll do. and of course, you get self-indulgent, spoiled brats. Now, I was raised by West Africans. I don't need. To, I was not smothered, <laughs> right? Mine very much lent towards the authoritarian side. You know, when I hear, you know, sometimes my English friends talking about, oh, my parents never said they loved me, I think, oh, come man. You know, um, but they don't know that they're doing it. My, my dad, my late father, he was a, a mega authoritarian, but he thought this is for your own good. And, and he absolutely meant that. And he, he's one of the most loving people I know, but he used to shout his head off. I would do the, the, the sneeze or sniff the wrong way. Ah! And in his mind, that was what I needed. So for those of us who can kind of stand outside the circle a bit and see these scenarios playing out, we've got to teach on it. And now there are people kind of over this side of the room um, who uh, will, will know much more than I do about how to nurture this relationship between teachers and evangelists, because I think that's kind of what it's going to come down to. Um, but, I, but I think we need that that needs work. We've got to be able, and it's got to, it's got to work both ways, because evangelists will have their own criticisms of teachers, but we've got to allow that dialogue to happen. Uh, because uh, in, at their heart of hearts, they will not want to actually be spoiling the congregation and smothering the congregation. I just don't think they know that they're doing it. And so, you know, as I say, it comes out in dialogue. Uh, Andy, thank you very much, for, first of all, for the sermon. But um, I've got a two-part question. The first one is, um, is there any video footage of the 1997 <laughs> Women's Day? <laughs> Fortunately uh, not. OK, that's fine. So the second part is more personal. <laughs> Uh, to us, and thank you for sharing about your son. I remember we met him in Manchester yeah, years ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. Our son, a uh, beautiful boy, 19-year-old Jonathan, is autistic. Mm. And not just for that, but this idea of, of gifts mm -hmm. and including everybody uh, and regarding that dis disability. We have a high proportion in a small church of people with mental and physical disabilities. So we're trying to include them, but in this dialogue, can you give us some input yeah. to best help? Yeah. Um, it definitely needs specialist help. I don't think it's something that you can just, you know, there's, there's no snazzy sermon which will, which will fix that. Um, a friend of mine who's actually a um, professor at, uh, where is he now? He is at Aberdeen University. And his name's Grant McCaskill, and he's one of the most furiously brilliant minds in the biblical world. Um, now, he recently found out that he's on the autistic spectrum. Um, and he's written a book called um, Autism in the Church. Um, it's powerful and it's disturbing, um, but it was, it's important reading, I think. Um, the thing I would say about this is that we, we ought to not let mental disability be the church's dirty little secret. This is something which exists in society, and the church exists in society. And so it's something that we have to have a response to, and not a glib response to. Right? It's not, um, he doesn't have mental problems, he's just unspiritual. Right? We, let's not go down that road. But what we... What we 
must do, I think, is bring in specialist help. And we even have Christian specialists all over the world who, who, who deal with this kind of thing. Um, and it has to become a part of the conversation in your context. Now, especially if you're in a small group uh, and there are a few people who, who have, have those challenges, then that's something which is, I'm not saying it should become your gospel, um, but it, it has to be a significant part of it. And everyone has to have a, you know, be, be interested. It, it can't just be sort of the, uh, something for the, the leaders and the, and the people suffering from its issue. What, one of the things that's really touched me when I was in the church in Manchester was um, how people dealt with my son and people going out of their way to actually go and, and talk to him. You, you can't, I mean, my son just wants to be in his own world. He doesn't want to speak to people. He especially doesn't want to speak to me, right? But, and so, he, you know, you would hardly get two words out of him, but the fact that people actually went and tried and had the patience to sit down and, and even try, that just spoke volumes. Uh, and, and that, I think, is what um, a, a, all communities need. I will piggyback onto my husband because it's interesting. We've not been whispering, so I don't know, didn't know what he was going to say. <laughs> um, I was actually also going to bring up Jonathan's autism, but actually in response to what Brad was saying, I'm going to stand up because so, I'm short. Um, <laughs> but because Brad, you were saying about um, people who feel like they're less gifted. And I feel like this is an issue that there's the gifts that are obvious that everybody sees, and this is not just church, this is just in society. There's just gifts that everybody sees, and then there's the gifts that people don't see. And then there's beyond that, I think, that God works in mysterious ways that we will never comprehend. And God works through people and situations in ways that, are, that change the world, and we don't catch that it even has done so, I think. Um, and when I think, for example, about Jonathan... Um, and I, this is, you know, every kid is, with autism is different. I actually see his autism as a gift. Mm. Yeah. And for one thing, it makes him who he is. He's a very special boy, but also the way it affects the rest of us. Our older son, Elijah, has got to be one of the most patient kids. Mm and has become such an amazing, compassionate big brother hmm. because his brother has autism. Yep. I have learned so much. Ali has learned so much. And I think that actually his gift has a ripple effect that we're not even going to grasp. And I think that every person, and I think that if I, if I look at it like that, then I can see that from God's perspective, actually everyone is equally gifted. It's just that not all the gifts are as visible to the human eye. Absolutely. And so that was my thought on that. And then um, my thought on the tensions in scripture made me think about the Psalms because some of the Psalms are like harsh, like destroy all my enemies, blow them up, kill them all. And I don't, th and I don't think for a minute God wants us to actually feel, think like that. But I think, you know, what you said about how, you know, Paul is different in different situations and also that your comment about, you know, was it right for Paul to rebuke Peter in public? I think just like in the Old Testament, was it right for Abraham to lie? Was it like for, right for, um, well, all of the bad kings who did not? I mean, there's lots of stories where it's a story, not God telling us, go be like that. Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, that's also part of the perspective for the tensions in the Bible. And, but, but I think that's a very interesting question to look at situations where, okay, was, was Paul being a bit harsh? Or perhaps his audience needed to hear something slightly differently. Yeah, yeah. Again, the way he talks to different churches is very different based on what their needs are, based on what their problems are. So maybe even that was a part of it. But thank you so much, because I think that was such a needed message. And I can identify. <laughs> thank you. I, I would just add a note about genre. Remember, the, the Psalms are poetry. They are songs. Um, so, you know, you shouldn't read Psalm 137 and go and start dashing babies against rocks, right? <laughs> it, it, it's, but, but think about what's happening, right? This is a, a, an Israelite exile who has seen Babylonians dashing their babies against the rocks and feeling mad it would be nice to dash their babies against a rock. 
And sometimes I think when we, you know, as, as Steve was talking about earlier about entering into the story, I think somehow sometimes we can deal with our own emotions by seeing how the psalmist does. Because he gets raw. The psalmist is accusing God and why have you abandoned me and all these sorts of things. But often what you get, in, even in the lament psalms, is they, they begin with this kind of raw, unvarnished emotion. And then by the end of it, you kind of get a resolution. By the end of it, it's like, yes, but God, you're amazing. And yes, you made this. And yes, you made that. And, um, but, but I think it's actually, it's actually good personal, emotional counselling to get into the heart and mind of the psalmist sometimes. So. I was wondering if you could maybe comment a little bit more on bringing along a whole church in the sense that I think sometimes the answer to unity, people think, well, the status quo. Yeah. Uh, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Um, and you made a comment at the beginning, something about something kind of about a pseudo community that can about? look. I'm using the term pseudo community, but okay. it looks unified oh, yeah, yeah, okay. on the yeah, surface. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I forget mean. exactly how you put it, but yeah. because we're in times where so much is changing, uh, it seems like. Anyway, just any practical ideas on navigating a lot of the things that are coming up that are, seem to be calling out for change, but that a certain amount of the church might be saying, no, we're, we're okay, uh, the status quo is safe, uh, we're afraid of certain changes, and we're to just say to somebody, the resurrection is the most important thing. <laughs> yeah. You know what? No, no, so anyway, right. any you're practical... Right. Thoughts on dealing with all that? Yeah. Um, I mean, the, 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 f the first thing, and, and this is, um, I had to kind of have this out with a, an Anglican minister, not have it out, but we, we got into it, with, I got into it with an Anglican minister about this, because I, I just talked, given a, a, a lecture on, this was shortly after the George Floyd murder, uh, and I used as an example um, a black curate who was turned down from a post um, because he was told that the community was too, and I'm, I'm quoting now, was monochrome white working class, and he was told he wouldn't fit in, and he was not given the job on that basis. And it was that that prompted Justin Welby to actually say, and for those of you who don't know, Justin Welby is the Archbishop of Canterbury, it's the most senior Anglican role in the country, to say that the Church of England is still institutionally racist. Um, now, when I, when I said, when I, I brought this, this up, this Anglican minister, who is also an, an academic, a brilliant Greek scholar, um, and he said to me, look, I'm, I'm a minister in a white, monochrome, working class. What am I supposed to do about the comfortabilities and the sensibilities of my audience? Some of whom may not even have seen a black person before, except on television, literally. And my response to him was, show me the part of the gospel that says Christianity is supposed to be comfortable. Comfortable? Where, where's the comfortable bit? I think, honestly, I, I, and again, I, I don't mean to be glib when I say this, but I think some Christians need to be more disturbed. And I totally get the safety of the status quo. Quite frankly, I enjoy it myself sometimes. Um, but you know that there are times when you are genuinely being called higher. And it's strange because I think the George Floyd incident happening at a time during the lockdown when we were all forced to be at home and many of us were forced to watch this thing all play out on our TV screens and we couldn't go outside to get away from it um, was an interesting confluence of events. Um, it was almost as if someone somewhere was saying, you need to all see this, and you need to stop pretending it's not happening. Yeah. And I think this is a little bit how we have to be with the way that the world is changing. And, and the message I think that's got to come from the teachers is that it might feel safe to do this now, and put your finger and go, la, 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 this isn't happening. It might feel safe now, but it's not gonna remain safe when you know there is confusion about gender identity 
when there's confusion about social justice issues, when there's confusion about sexuality, and we, 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 we kind of, we, we, we slightly sort of stay behind the parapet for now, but there will be a time, and it's coming, and it's already happening, when you literally won't be able to avoid it. There will be a time, and I say, I think it's already happening, when our young people will be more influenced by TikTok than they will be by a sermon. And that being the case, it's time to get uncomfortable. It's time to stop hiding behind, this is not really happening. It, it, it is happening, and it's happening in your households. And it's happening even if you don't know that it's happening. Um, because your kids, uh, our kids, are glued to their phones, and they are immersed sometimes in worlds which many of us don't even understand. If we didn't grow up with this stuff, we, wouldn't, we don't relate to it. Uh, and again, my 19-year-old daughter, who is a, a connoisseur of TikTok, um, you know, sometimes she, even the abbreviations she uses sometimes. One day she said to me, my dad, that's not my POV. I said, pardon? <laughs> my POV, my point of view. <laughs> like it's a thing, and I'm an idiot for not knowing what that was, right? So, for those reasons, you know, again, I think it comes back to dialogue. And this is where teachers have got to be um, able to address this kind of stuff. And here's something I learned from Methodist minister. Um, I asked a question after he gave a, a, a talk on um, uh, bringing academic education into the church. Uh, and I said to him, What's, what, what, what are the real keys that you've taken away as an academic when you, you move in church spaces, right? Because most people in churches really don't want to know that there's an academic world out there and people arguing over participles and that kind of thing. Um, and, and I was expecting this huge technical answer and he said, trust. He said, if the people trust you, then no matter how complex an idea, they'll know that as you're steering them through it, that you have their best interests at heart. And this is something I think is really important for those of us who teach. The congregations have got to trust us. The reason they're suspicious is that they think we live in these ivory towers and that we speak all these weird biblical languages and that we're doing some kind of Christian voodoo that only we know about. And that there's some secret that we know that they're not privy to. Uh, and it, it becomes this sort of spooky, mysterious, murky world called academia, which is somehow opposed to devotional Christianity. And somehow teachers have got to break those barriers and make them realize that the only reason we get so nerdy about this stuff is because we want to walk with God. That's, that's, that's the sole purpose. Um, and we can write articles and write books, but at the end of the day, my reason for plumbing the depths of these texts is because I want to know God. It's that simple. And if, if people know that, I think they'll, they'll trust us. Uh, and then we can have those difficult conversations. Hello. Uh, thank you for this lesson. It was very amazing. Like some point I was uh, thinking, are you reading my mind? Because <laughs> I Just have, so you know, I wasn't. <laughs> because I have thought like almost month about uh, equality. And uh, for me, it is, it is very important topic. And uh, I have two questions. Uh, first is, uh, how you think, uh, like, we have many roles in church, mm -hmm. leaders, shepherds, and evangelists, mm -hmm. but how we can be better leader to take each other more equal? Yeah. And the second one is very similar, one other question, but uh, how we can show as leader uh, to people who doesn't understand how important they are, uh, how, how important they are? Yeah. Like, Thank you. No, no, two excellent questions. Um, I'll try and answer them succinctly because I could, we'd, we'd almost take a whole other lesson to really address those properly, right? Um, so to the first question, how we show um, the equality of the roles. One of the things I think which is critically important, I, I didn't have time to bring it in today, but it, it is key, I think, to some parts of Ephesians, is that we cannot confuse leadership with power. Jesus' definition, and not definition, but when he said in, um, in Mark 10 that 
the Gentiles, those people out there, kind of, they lord their authority over people. They want you to know, I'm in charge and you're under me. And he said, not so with you. He said, the one who wants to be the greatest must be the least. The one who wants them to be the most powerful must be the servant of everyone. It's completely counterintuitive. But if every big leader, quote unquote, had that attitude, what you've mentioned there, it wouldn't even be a problem. Because far from um, sort of vying for the top spot, we'd almost be vying, vying for the bottom spot. And leadership is not power. Leadership is servanthood. That's something which needs a lot more unpacking. Power is about control. And a leader's role is not to control the congregation. In terms of um, helping other people see that their gifts are important, it kind of relates to something that I said before. I, partly, I think it is just about celebrating everything that people do, um, sort of uh, uh, practically. But I think, again, just also just, I, I think just teaching about, because I, I, I don't think in our fellowships generally, I don't think it's been the case that anyone has got up and said, right, I'm the evangelist, I'm therefore the most important person in the room. It's something that we've kind of acquired by osmosis because they're always on the pulpit, they're always doing the talking, and they seem to be the, you know, the person that the spotlight's on all the time. And maybe this goes back to something that David was saying about you know, the format of our services. And I'm not saying we need to sort of rip it up and start again necessarily, but maybe we can think of some more creative ways where the spotlight is taken off the preacher guy who is then the centre of all attention. In any worship service, the centre of attention has got to be Jesus. Uh, and everyone else can be in whatever, you know, it doesn't really matter. It's Jesus first, everyone else kind of joint second. Um, but again, I think it's the responsibility of those at the pulpit to engender that in people. Remember, we've got time for, I think we're due to finish at five, so time for one more question, if that's okay. Hi. Hi there, thanks so much. Really, really appreciated it. Um, it's just a couple of things. The first one, I don't know if you'll be able to answer it, but how do you start that dialogue or how do you explain maybe that tension where you feel like maybe what's being asked of you is to kind of buy into this uniformity as opposed to unity? And the second one, uh, yes, I was just wondering if you had any ideas. The second one is just... Um, as you were talking about gifts um, and your son and the couple over there who were talking about their son, um, I work in a place where they're adults and they have learning difficulties. So literally it's a huge range. You have autism, you have autism spectrum, you have all sorts of people, schizophrenia, everything. The one thing that I would say is I actually feel gifted working there because I feel like there's a capacity for so much love, mm. and it's yeah. unconditional, yeah, and yeah, I yeah. feel so loved. I walk yeah. out of there, and I feel loved. And so I feel like sometimes it may well be that by seeing and looking for these gifts, that you get something that you can't buy, you know, yeah, or, or is invisible. Yeah, yeah. I agree. And, and, I, and I, I double acknowledge that and what Wendy was saying earlier, that I think when we have these people around us, to not see them as problems, but to see, see that, that actually they help our faith and our sense of compassion as well. Um, you know, Aaron has taught me patience. I'm not a patient person at all. Um, but with Aaron, I, I have no choice. It's either patience or death, you know, pick one. Um, with regards to starting that conversation, um, I'd be lying if I said I knew how to, because I don't. The only thing I would say, and, and you know, it's because this is actually quite a real thing for me personally and a few others I'm connected to at, at the moment. Um, and, and I think starting that conversation, um, the, the key thing, well, well, two key things. The first is courage, because it's much easier just to sort of retreat into our little spaces and pretend it's not really happening. And we can't do that. Um, but the second thing I think is empathy. Uh, and again, I think I go back to the point that David made today with the, the, the quadrant and the, the four sort of spirituality types. Um, I think if we recognize that we all have good motives, even if we all see the Christian faith in a slightly different way, 
will create the space where we can have this dialogue in non-confrontational fashion. This, this is the sweet spot. This is, you know, this is the Aristotelian golden mean, is to be able to have really difficult conversations in a space that's completely safe. How we do that, I don't know, but I think it begins with courage and with empathy. Amen. It's been a, uh, a, an amazing conversation, a discussion, not the end, but the beginning. I hope we can carry on this discussion uh, as we have a break now. But uh, just want to say thank you, Andy, for an amazing... Thank you.